And, and uh, friends, let me just say thank you so much for your, your support, uh, Ken, for that wonderful prayer that you prayed for us and, and just the whole family. That really, really, really means a lot to us. And just thank you, St. James, because uh, you're an awesome church. We're so excited that we can be here now for what will become 10 years by the following summer. And uh, we're grateful to God for appointing us here to Athens. I tell you, there's really no other place we'd rather be. And um, thank you just for your prayers and your faithfulness this past year. Because, it, yeah, it's been challenging for all of us. It's been challenging for you. It's been hard for us, too, at the church. Um, but I tell you, God is good, and God has given us a wonderful staff. And I couldn't do anything, you know, without without. God's blessing and leadership and a staff to work with us has been so um, so dearly committed to carrying out the gospel of Christ. So thank you to the staff because they're the ones who really make things happen around here um, through Christ. So thank you all. Um, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Uh, Nathan's going to be reading from the book of Hebrews here in just a second as we look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. Um, but before we do that, let me, uh, let me also say um, what I plan on doing today. Um, I know that a lot of you all have been reading in the news the last couple of weeks. You've probably heard it, maybe even on television, but certainly on the Internet, uh, just about what is taking place in the Methodist Church, even on a more local level in North Georgia here, like with a church over in Marietta called Mount Bethel, in which uh, their pastor has now um, been reassigned, and there's just a... a very deep backstory to all of that, but I know that a lot of people have been wondering, you know, what's going on in the Methodist Church, and so what I plan on doing today is really kind of a, addressing the issue about what's, where we are as a church. You've heard me say consistently for a long time now that I know um, that a split is going to occur in the United Methodist Church. Uh, we need it. Uh, we needed it yesterday. In fact, we probably would have already had it last um, last May, uh, a year ago, were it not for COVID hitting. And that just kind of pushed things off into the to the future, and um, it looks like we won't be able to have our general conference, so that issue can be voted on this year, so it's probably going to be another year. So um, we need to just keep praying, but the whole thing that has been the presenting issue, at least, for the United Methodist Church for what's causing this division with people on two different sides um, not agreeing with each other has been one over homosexuality. But that really is just simply the flashpoint issue. It goes much, much deeper than that because at the core of it, what we're dealing with is, I mean, it really in its essence is, is what's written here true. That's it. Are we going to follow what the Scripture has been teaching for over 3,000 years, just like other faithful people have? Um, and so I'll talk about that today um, and then where we go from here. Um, and next week, let me say that uh, we got something a little different for you lined up next week, which would be kind of fun. I'll be moderating this, and as Nathan's already mentioned, you're going to have a chance to send in your questions over the next few days, and we're going to address those questions. So we'll have kind of like a, a line of leaders up here, um, and we will be fielding some of the questions that you ask, and um, we'll try to get them in but so we can talk about what's going on and then even questions you have about the Scripture. So uh, we'll be able to do that, and so it should be kind of fun next week. Uh, I'll tell you what, now we're going to ask Nathan to come up, and he will be reading this from Hebrews. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him he endured the cross, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Mm. Now may God put what is written here into our thinking, and may we live it out always in our lives. Would you join us as Nathan prays? Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we can just come together, Lord. And 
Father God, we just ask that today that you would just uh, place a special anointing on Pastor Bill. Um, I ask that you would just give him boldness and confidence as he just uh, comes and delivers this message to us, Lord. Father, we ask that you would just um, help uh, us to just uh, hear from you, hear from you directly, Lord, and just discern um, your, uh, your will and your direction for the church. And we just pray for a special anointing on the Methodist Church, Lord, that you would just give us wisdom and discernment as we just take these next steps um, um, in the directions that, that you want them to go. We don't want it to be man-made. We want it to be one yeah. that, 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 that you have um, inspired us to do, That's Lord. Right. And so we just ask that you would just uh, place your hand upon it and that place your hand upon Pastor Bill this morning and just be with us. In Jesus Christ's holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Nathan. You know, I remember back in 1990, Sherry and I were really good friends, and one day I saw her, she was reading a, a book, a really big, thick um, book with a black cover on it, and I didn't recognize it, and so I asked her, you know, exactly what it was that she was reading, and she told me at the time, and I was not a believer, um, she told me that she was reading the Bible, and I started laughing at that, um, not to insult her, not to be rude, but just that it just really caught me off guard, and it just so surprised me, it's just like, well, I was a pretty girl reading the Bible, that just made no sense to me as a 23-year-old, I just couldn't understand it, it's just like, I can't wrap my mind around this, why, because it's such an old, archaic uh, book that really just belongs on a shelf somewhere, collecting dust, and, and why is she reading this, and she said, Bill, she goes, this is for me, she goes, when I have questions in my life, this is where I turn for answers, and God, you know, just kind of leads me, gives me the answers that I'm, that I'm looking for. And I said, really? Wow. And I just started thinking about that, and it just so blew my mind. I never could have imagined that four years later, Sherry and I would be married, and we would be living, not in Georgia, but we'd be living in Lexington, Kentucky, horse country of all places, that we'd be out of what really felt like football country. Because they're into basketball up there, you know, and, and I mean, they consider themselves being the South, but they don't have a great football team, and they don't drink sweet tea. So, that told me, well, they're not really part of the real South, and so I couldn't imagine not living there in the real South, and so God uh, sent us up there. I never saw that one coming, that, and also that I'd be enrolled in seminary at a place where I'd be studying the Bible that I once used to laugh about. Thinking like, this stuff can't apply to us. And what does it even mean? Well, there I was. Um, nor could I have imagined that two years after that, I'd still be a student in a seminary, Asbury Seminary, uh, where one day when I was going to class and I felt led just to kind of go to a, a prayer chapel for just a few moments, um, and then God would keep me in that prayer chapel for five hours deep in prayer because the presence of God fell on me, and I couldn't be anywhere else. And I remember during that time, in that day, on that October day in 1996, I remember I felt like God just, he, he he was leading me to put both hands on a Bible. Now, there was an open Bible that was right there in that really small prayer chapel. And it was, a, it was even thicker than, than Sherry's Bible that she'd been reading uh, previously. But it was a really huge Bible. And I remember putting my hands on this Bible, and it was like my hands were magnetized to the Bible. And I just sat there on my knees, and I just was just praying, and I was praying. And I must have stayed in that position for about an hour, and I just could not take my hands off the Bible. And it was just kind of a supernatural thing. And... You know, the Lord was just drawing me to his scriptures and, and just teaching me that what I have said and what I have written here is just so holy. I guess it shouldn't have surprised me that sometime after that, I would have preached the very first sermon that I ever delivered in a church setting, and it would be from Joshua chapter 1. And I'd preach on verse 8, which says this, Moses is dead, and God is having a conversation with Joshua. And he tells Joshua, he says, Keep this book of the law on your lips. Now, back then, the Jewish people, they had, their Old Testament basically consisted of five books of the Old Testament. 
it was Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So five books. And, and that was it. That was their entire Bible. That's all they had to work with. And then God added through the years after that, you know, making the Old Testament a little bit thicker. But God told them this. He said, keep this book of the law. So that's what they called it originally. It was, it was um, God's law through Moses to the people about how the Jewish people were to live faithfully as God led them. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. So God was saying, Joshua, for you and the three million people that I brought out of Egypt, I want y'all to, to just always be reciting Scripture. Keep it on your tongue. Be talking about the Bible. Teach the Bible. Listen to the Bible. Um, speak about it in your home when you're teaching your children and your grandchildren about what I am, am revealing from heaven down to earth. Always be talking about it. Always keep it on your minds and in your hearts. That's what meditate on it day and night means. Be thinking about it. Be praying about it. Don't ever let it get out of your ear sight, your eyesight, or off of your mind. Now, God told them this. Why? It's because of what the back part of verse 8 says. So that you may be careful to do everything written in it. You know, things have not changed in 3,000 years. God is still saying the same thing to us, that we have to be obedient to what God reveals. Even when we don't understand it, even if we don't like it, we just keep following, right? It's the way that people of faith are to live. So, um, that is part of the reason why our Methodist church has gotten in, in, in so much, um, I guess, trouble or there's been division is because some people are not uh, going the same way that the Lord has always revealed from the scriptures. Now, as I said, homosexuality is the flashpoint. That's the one that's the presenting issue for us, but it's not really the true issue. But, but I want to talk about that a little bit and just let you know as a pastor where I stand and why I do, okay? I want you to hear my heart. Um, the scripture says from Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, it says there that um, you are not to have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Now, two chapters later, the Lord reveals the same thing to Moses when he says, if a man has sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. Now, hear this. Leviticus is part of the Old Covenant. It was the, the original agreement between God and his people. And, and so that's the Old Covenant. Now, the Old Covenant is no longer in existence today. Because it's been replaced with what? A new covenant. That's right. Yeah, how about that? That's complicated, wasn't it? Um, yeah, a new covenant that Jesus brought from heaven to earth to give us. Now, here's the tricky part. There are parts of the Old Covenant um, and, and the Old Testament that no longer apply to us today because they were situation-specific for that point in time. But... They were holy. They were, they're God's holy words, so they're not to be messed with. They're to be revered. And there's truth in what God taught the Jewish people back then as it pertained to things about like what they were to wear and even foods they were to stay away from. We don't put all of those same Old Testament regulations into practice today um, because that was part of the Old Covenant. And some people say that, okay, well, I can, I can wear these kind of clothes that the Bible's saying, you know, don't wear, or I can let my hair grow a little bit longer, or I could get a tattoo, or I can eat shrimp and oysters. Um, and, and that was kind of prohibited back then. Um, so some things were culturally relevant to that point in time. But there are other parts of the Old Covenant that are still in effect, such as the, the Ten Commandments, right, from the book of Exodus. You shall not have any other gods before me. You shall not lie. You shall not murder. You shall not, um, 
you shall not obviously deceive your, your neighbor. You shall honor your father and your mother. These are timeless principles that although they're part of the old covenant, they still carry through into the new covenant. So the hard part is discerning, okay, well, which one applies because it was still the voice of God back then, which one applies today. Now, here's the way I look at it when it comes to same-sex relations is that if that were the only place in the Bible that you'd find it just only in Leviticus, it was only part of the Old Covenant, and it wasn't even talked about in the New Testament, I would probably wonder myself, I'd probably say, you know, like, huh, I wonder, God, if this is still relevant today or if that was just meant for Moses and them back then. But, fortunately, God takes something that could have been muddy and he makes the water really, really clear for us so that we're not confused about this by addressing it thoroughly in the New Testament. Because we see from the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 10, Paul is writing to us and he's telling us that God's law was made for, and let me go ahead and give you a little bit of a heads up here. There's like a listing of all different kinds of, of lifestyles, that we as Christians are to see, okay, these are spiritually unhealthy. We're not to be a part of this. So he kind of gives just a lot of different categories. And he says God's law is for to teach the sexually immoral. Um, it's for those who practice homosexuality. It's for slave traders, liars, perjurers, and for everything else that is contrary to the sound doctrine of the Bible. So clearly God is saying there with same-sex relations, it's, it's not good. Stay away from it. Also, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, we see that God says, the Holy Spirit says to us today still, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, and it lists others, then it says, we'll inherit the kingdom of God. So in other words, God's saying, you know what? These kind of things are not of heaven. They're of earth or they come from hell. And, you know, you live this way and it's just not what heaven-bound people are to live like. Now the good news is, friends, is that we serve a God of grace, and there is grace in how God looks at this. And so you think about, like, okay, well, idolaters. Well, heck, that could be me, right? Because if you, if you put more trust in what's in your wallet, I can't put much trust in what's in my wallet because I don't have a whole lot in here. Sherry's the one who, who gives me my, you know, my weekly allowance, and, uh, and some days it's not enough. But anyway, so I can't put a lot of trust in that, but, but sometimes people can put trust in what's in their bank account, and, and that's idolatry. All right? If you, if you um, lean on more for comfort and relief from your problems, from a bottle or a drug or anything else like that, that too is idolatry. You know, I bet Kanye West feels really good. Kanye would probably say, and he's this, this kind of great, really uh, uber-talented musician today uh, and singer, Kanye would probably say that um, he used to live under the swoon of idolatry because he idolized his fame and he idolized his fortune. But he found Jesus. And he's been saved. He's been redeemed. And so no longer is he captured and ensnared by the sin of idolatry. So it's not just that people who used to do these things can't go to heaven. No, we get to go to heaven because Jesus erases our sins through faith in him. So God's saying these lifestyles are, are outlawed. If you fall into them, you can receive grace from me, but... Don't just keep acting cavalierly like this stuff doesn't matter because it does. And it is a matter of living true to an all-holy God. So um, what we see in the scriptures is, let me kind of pull this back a little bit. We find that it's talked about in the Old Testament. Homosexuality is talked about even more in the New Testament. So God actually makes the argument stronger in the 
new covenant than he does in the old covenant. So that's just God's way of saying, I'm very serious about this topic. We do find what God's answer is for marriage, though. We find that uh, it's located right there in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, where um, God makes Adam and Eve. By the way, do you know who the first minister was that uh, conducted the wedding ceremony at the very first wedding on earth? Do you know who that minister was? Yeah, it was God. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Y'all, y'all know the answer to that. That's correct. Because God created Adam. Then uh, God said, you know what? Adam looks a little lonely. I need to, need to give him a spouse. And so he made Eve. And the scripture says that God brought Eve to Adam. And then it says, this is why a man will leave his father and mother when he grows up and be joined to his wife, and then they will become together one flesh. So God's, um, God's formula for a holy, God-blessed marriage has always been and always will be until Jesus comes back, one man, one woman. That's the only kind of marriage that God blesses his permanent marriage formula. Now, um, when it comes to the issue of um, same-sex couples being married, um, people can't argue it from the scriptures, who, who, are, who are for, who are pro-homosexual. They can't argue it from the scriptures because it's an airtight argument. You, you can't get around it. So there's a couple of creative ways then that people will try to justify why they think that it is okay and that God permits it today. All right, they will, they will use a couple different angles. One is dealing with slavery and then one is dealing with um, women who are being ordained as ministers. So I'll cover that one in a couple weeks about the, the woman issue. And I'm actually going to do this on Mother's Day. So come back on May the, I think May the 9th is maybe Mother's Day. Come back on that day and I'll be talking about that issue um, and how that argument doesn't work about like, well, God has, um, God has clearly said, some, the argument goes, some people believe, God says that uh, women can't uh, preach the gospel, they can't lead churches, and, and we ignore those teachings from the Bible um, and we ordain women. So then if God is teaching here that uh, it's not okay to be, have a homosexual marriage or, or else uh, for gay people to be, become pastors, why do we then, why can't we ordain them? Because we ordain women, why don't we just ordain gay people? All right, so I'll talk about that in two weeks. Next week, though, I'm also looking forward to this Q&A session that we do with the church leaders up here. So, but today, what I want to look at next is this whole idea about, some people say, the Bible is pro-slavery. And because it supports slavery, which we know is evil, then the Bible was wrong on the issue of slavery. Since it's wrong about slavery, then how can we trust it when it says that homosexuality is wrong? How do we know that it's actually not right, the reverse of that? So, many people in the Old Testament owned slaves. All right? Slave, slavery was a common practice um, back then. Part of our, our difficulty, though, when we start looking at this issue is, is that we think about, you know, in the background of our mind, we know that living here in the American South, we know what slavery was like, you know, against the black people. We know that it was wicked. We know that evil was wrong. God is against slavery. No doubt about that. But American slavery, as it existed in our nation in the 16, 17, 1800s, American slavery is not the same thing as slavery that existed 2,000 years ago in Israel or in the Roman world. You're talking about two different things. First of all, back then, in Bible times, slavery had nothing to do with race. Well, in America, it was all about race, right? It was all about black people um, are less than, and they can be put in chains. Just horrible. All right, but back then, it wasn't so. Um, How did people become slaves back then? Well, they became slaves because a lot of times, when one country conquered another one, uh, they would then, they'd make the, the country that lost, they would make their population kind of like the slave population. 
Some people, though, became slaves um, in this fashion is because their debts got unmanageable. And so if uh, they were up to their eyeballs in debt, they would go to somebody who was wealthy in the town and they would say, hey, listen, I'm deep in the hole. Uh, I owe so-and-so a lot of money, and uh, let's strike a bargain. I'll work for you for the next three years. I will be your indentured servant if you will buy out the note, buy out the debt, pay it off that I owe, and I will be your slave for the next three years. And then the person will say, okay, bargain, you got a deal. And so, so some people were entering into it voluntarily in order to get you know, their financial picture um, in a little bit better shape. Now, the scripture talks about this. You find this over in the book of Exodus, what it says. Some people might go to a wealthy owner and say, hey, listen, I'm $2 million in debt. Um, I'll work for you for the next 20 years. But God tried to put limits on this stuff because it was getting out of control. And, and so in Exodus, we find God actually shortened the time so that people could only hold slaves in Israel for a maximum of seven years, and then they had to be freed every seven years. Didn't matter how much debt they owed. They had to be freed. All right, so God put that on there. And, of course, in America, we know slavery was completely different, right? You are born into it, and you die in slavery. There's no chance of getting out. Not so much um, back then. In fact, usually... Um, most people were out of slavery by the time that they were 30 years old. Um, in fact, um, you also find that God said, all right, if you go and you kidnap somebody and you make them into your slave, which is exactly what slave traders did over in Africa, right? It was a money-making venture. It was an enterprise. They would go capture um, horribly black families, put them on a ship, bring them over to America. God said, if you do that kind of stuff and you go hijack people and, and if you take advantage of them like that, you die. It's right there out of Exodus 21, 16. Now, um, back then in the Roman world, um, back in Bible days, uh, some slaves were used on a farm. Sometimes they were in, used in mines, and it was kind of, kind of a, a hard way to earn a living. I mean, it was, it was not easy. But did you know that many times back then, slaves actually had a profession? You could have, hey, Vent, you're a doctor. Some slaves could be physicians. Some slaves were teachers. Others were accountants. Some of them were sea captains. So they would have somebody who would sell themselves into slavery. They didn't have a trade, and their slave owner would then teach them a trade. He would actually want them to become educated. That was not the case in the South where, where black people were denied an education, and they were kept in illiteracy. So totally different back then. I mean, to compare American slavery with biblical, or slavery that exists in biblical times is like comparing a maple tree to an azalea bush. You're talking about two different things, all right? Now, Paul, though, addresses, he touches on the slavery issue in a big way in the letter of Philemon. It's in the New Testament. Paul is writing to a slave owner. This is why this is so, so relevant. He's writing to a slave owner whose name is Philemon, and he's making an appeal for his, one of his slaves who ran away from Philemon. The guy's name was Onesimus. He ran away, and he got hooked up with Paul, and, um, and Paul actually led him to Christ, I guess. So he became a Christian. So Paul is now sending him back to Philemon, and he says, listen, Paul is urging him to let him go free. Because Paul knew slavery is not good. That's why he would write um, not only that to Philemon, but he also put from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23, he's talking to Christians, and he says, Look, Jesus has paid for you by dying for you on a cross. You were The, the word is, you were bought at a price. Therefore, do not become slaves of human masters. 
Paul saying, don't go into slavery. It's not good. So to say that the Bible is pro-slavery is completely false. It's not to understand the scriptures at all. All right, now, um, as I said, in a couple weeks, I'll talk about the whole issue about, like, well, if the slavery argument doesn't work then, and we can't use that as a way to justify homosexuality, what about the whole issue with women in ministry? I'll address that then. Uh, But in the meantime, and I look forward to our Q&A next week, but in the meantime, what God wants us to do is this. He does not want you and I in the midst of all the noise, to be distracted for why we are put on earth. Don't be distracted. You know, I really think that's kind of the, the message that a, a quarterback like JT Daniels gets. We, you know, a lot of dog fans believe that he's going to be the starting quarterback uh, for the Bulldogs at their first game in the fall. And um, I imagine that Kirby has, has his quarterback coach teaching this and hammering this into JT Daniels all the time. He's like, look, JT, when you get the ball, when the ball is hiked to you, um, don't be distracted by these 300-pound oak trees who are running at you and they're on skates. Yes, they're all swole. Yes, they're, they're, their biceps look almost as big as Bill's. Yes, they are ripped to the core. And, but, but don't look at these defensive tackles when they're charging at you. Look instead at your receivers downfield. They're your target. Don't be distracted by this other stuff. You're going to see them in the corner of your eye, but don't just sit there and look at how big they are. Man, they're about to cream me. You know, no, 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 keep your eye on the target. And I think that's what the Lord is saying to us because over in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is writing to Christians who had been intensely persecuted. He tells them something fascinating. In the midst of how hard things were in their own lives, he says, let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. That's the race of faith. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So Paul is telling them to the people, the Christians, who are faithful. Don't be focused on what you can't control. Focus on on what you do have ability to control and what you can focus on, on the right thing, not the wrong thing. Look at God. Look at Christ. And so, friends, um, try to pay attention to what's going on, but don't be absorbed by it. Know about it, but don't be controlled by it. Okay? Don't live in the dark, but yet don't let that just simply pull you away. Because God has put you here, and we as a church are to engage our community with the good news of Jesus and equip believers to become devoted followers of Christ in five points and out all around. We are to take the gospel to the world who needs it so desperately, just like other people did for us. So listen, in this coming week and for the rest of your life, look at Jesus. Don't take your eyes off of Jesus. Keep your focus on Jesus and always stare at Jesus. Because he's the way and the truth and the life and always will be. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and God's kids said, Amen.